Hello everyone, my name is Mukul and this is the Deep Neural Notebooks podcast. In this episode, I interview Varun Jampani, who is a research scientist at Google Research. His work lies at the intersection of machine learning and computer vision. His main focus is to leverage machine learning techniques for better inference in computer vision models. Prior to joining Google, he was a research scientist at NVIDIA. He completed his PhD at the Max Planck Institute in Tübingen, Germany. He completed his bachelor's and master's at IIIT Hyderabad. In this video, we talk about his journey from his bachelor's and master's at IIIT Hyderabad to his PhD at the Max Planck Institute, about how his research has shaped over the years, and about his focus on always asking good research questions and tackling fundamental problems in computer vision as a whole. We also talk about the Super Slow Mo paper, about how it started, about the key design decisions that were made, and about the challenges that were faced along the way. If there is one thing that you are likely to take away from this episode, it is the importance of asking good research questions and letting that drive your research and lifelong learning. These podcast conversations are also available across all major podcast streaming platforms like Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, Breaker, Anchor and all of those. I hope you like this episode and learn something valuable from the conversation. Thank you for watching or listening. Thank you. Shall we start? Yeah, sure. Great. Uh, hello, Varun, sir. Uh, thank you for talking to me. Uh, how are you? Yeah, good. How are you, Mukul? Right. I'm good. It's a pleasure to have you and uh, I'm quite excited because of two reasons. Reason one that when I started with deep learning about one and a half years back, the first paper that I came across, so it was for a project about HDR reconstruction using deep learning. So the first paper that I was told to read was the STPN paper, the Switchable Temporal Propagation Network. So mm, nice. I never knew that one day I'll be getting an opportunity to interview. And it yeah, feels yeah. great. Thanks. Yeah, yeah. Thanks for inviting me to your podcast. Right. Uh, reason to that you're also from IIIT. Uh, I'm an intern there for the last six months and you did your undergrad and master's from there. So it's good to have that in common. Nice. Good to know that. Um, so how is your IIIT experience so far? Good. Good. Mm-hmm. It's quite a great experience. I mean, only six months so far, but getting to learn a lot of things. So nice. great that. Uh, all right. So before I started, before I start with the background, I wanted to know about uh, how your research has been affected by the pandemic and like uh, how has your daily routine been affected how has the productivity been affected so could you talk about that yeah so i think there is some effect uh, but overall i have to say that like we are in a lucky uh, job position that we can just work with computers that right. because of the pandemic several other jobs are affected quite severely like construction or hospitality industry but uh, i have to say that like uh, we are in quite lucky position that we can still continue our jobs almost as normal as before uh, the only thing effect is that like because of working from home uh, i have a seven month old son and it gets a bit tricky to work from home so i have to find times uh, at night and in the early mornings to work more mm-hmm. other than that it is uh, is going fine i think uh, right but probably one good thing would be more time with their family so you can't put a price yeah on yeah 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 more time with the family but more tiring and also yeah. slightly less productive yeah <laughs> exactly exactly so another thing that has been affected because of the pandemic is the way that the conferences are held these days and so we had the we had a virtual cvpr conference this time and you got four papers accepted mm-hmm. there, so congratulations on that. Uh, so, uh, could you talk about how your experience was of this new format of the conference, and if you could compare the present virtual one, the recent virtual one, or the way it was held before? Like, could you draw any comparisons between the two? Uh, yeah, I think the it is kind of unfortunate to have a virtual conference. Actually, the physical one is definitely better because conference is also a great place to network with people and. Right to get to know, meet new people and uh, also get to know new researchers who, who have similar ideas and share similar passions. And so virtual in the sense is not that good uh, for networking. And on the on the other hand, there are some slight positives in the sense that uh, now all the videos are being recorded. So 
you can also watch the videos anytime and there is now the videos are more accessible to more people in the world right so for example i i organized a tutorial on novel view synthesis and we we recorded it in youtube and now it has over 5000 views so so which is quite nice so now it is more online accessible and but on the other hand i feel physical conference is much more better and also for poster sessions i feel the audience is much more uh in physical conference compared to in a virtual setting uh yeah so there are both pros and cons but in general physical conferences much better right right so uh, i was going through the papers that uh, or papers of yours that got accepted this year and i noticed that three of those papers have focused on self supervised learning so uh, i'm curious if uh, anything about self supervised learning or weekly supervised learning if anything in that domain interests you or are you looking forward to i mean what interests you basically about these weekly supervised systems uh in general i i like to see the computer vision as a whole and i i i, I, li- I like to solve the fundamental problems in computer vision i mean what makes a good computer vision system what are the fundamental principles that makes a good computer vision system i mean that there is a very difficult question to answer there is a long way to go and uh, so one of the things i believe is that like we actually learn as humans human human visual system we as we learn many of the things in a very weakly supervised manner or in a self supervised manner i mean we don't get a lot of data to annotated data to train our human visual system so i believe that it is possible to achieve similar things with computer vision system as well and so i am trying to explore what are the principles behind self supervised learning or unsupervised or uh, weakly supervised learning so that's what excites me most and i have been working on different uh questions related to self supervised learning right that's great so we'll talk more about your research but for the time being let's journey back uh, to your early days about how you started with computer science so i read that you did your bachelor's and masters from triple it hyderabad and mm-hmm. so like could you talk about uh, how you got started with computer science or programming like was it before college in college or like how did that start off yeah before going to triple it i don't i don't even know what computer science is actually i don't even know what <laughs> what 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 will be there in computer science actually at that time it was i was not sure what will be there in the university because both plus 1 and plus 2 it's it is mostly basic sciences like physics and mathematics and right uh, so i don't even i didn't even have a computer at home so uh, <laughs> I, didn't, i didn't know much about computer science so, so it is mostly yeah 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 considering very various aspects i thought because since the future is going to be in software i thought probably with computer science i can do more in the future i will be more empowered in doing things so that was a one main reason to choose computer science and, and also because computer science is most popular field at that time right. also probably now it's one of the most popular fields so right right even more uh, in, so in, a, not, in an institution like triple it hyderabad yeah and institute like triple it hyderabad is also even more popular and it's right. so so it is mostly not because of passion in computer science it is is mostly because it's popular and it's it's uh, <laughs> uh so that i can be more empowered to do things and it's uh, yeah i am i'm glad i made that choice and i feel i'm more empowered now because of doing computer science and right. bachelor's and masters that is quite similar to what happened with me what i was sure of i mean i was sure of that of the fact that i didn't want to pursue uh mechanical engineering or electrical engineering so yeah. uh in engineering the probably the most popular fields i had were computers or electri- electronics so mm-hmm. probably computers was more valued in my organization so i thought that i'll start with it and see how things go and yeah feel very very lucky that i start i mean i cho- got to um study computer science and yeah seems like one of the best random decisions for me yeah also I, actually at the time i was actually more passionate about uh flights and jet planes and kind of things and so i thought i would take aeronautical engineering that was my first choice but unfortunately there are not too many options in india for aeronautical engineering and right. 
yeah so i thought probably even with computer science probably i thought oh okay i can probably do some engineering i can move on to aeronautical engineering later on or something like that but but computer science itself is good and uh, so i stick here yeah so yeah. like a good decision right so do you remember your first coding project your computer science first code, computer science project yeah so at the time at triple it the c language course was taught by jawhar jawhar sir and uh it was a very nice course and he is quite good in teaching and so i still i still remember the coding projects or coding exams that he used to conduct so the, so so the exam is one and a half hour long or around one hour or one hour 15 minutes long and almost 80% of time we have to write the code in paper and <laughs> only during the last 10 15 minutes you will get computer to put oh. that code in and, and get it compiled and make it work so you have to make sure that whatever you write in the paper oh. has to work in the computer you can't change that later i mean you can change but you but you only have 10 yeah. minutes oh, right, so you right. can't do much in those 10 <laughs> minutes so right. you have to think well before writing the code so that actually that actually that's actually very good thing because that actually helps us think before i mean so that actually helps and getting a, as a good habit of writing a good code instead right. of just relying on compilation and fixing the things yeah. and so as, yeah that that i feel is quite nice so yeah also i did not uh i did not miss much of not knowing c programming or not knowing computers before like uh uh i feel that that was not a hindrance i think so yeah whatever is required is taught in the first semester hmm. or hmm. first few semesters so you can catch up even if you didn't have a computer science background in plus 1 and plus 2 Yeah yeah I actually think that actually helped because those who had computer science background they thought they already knew things so they could not uh pay more concentration the things mm-hmm. so they already the things but it's so sometimes it's good to start from scratch and start from uh right. blank slate uh right right great so so like uh, sorry varun uh, what was your uh, like motivation behind continuing in computers in choosing uh computers for your masters for your mtech uh yeah actually i choose dual degree course uh, oh. both bachelor's and masters together uh at at triplet because that's what i was because as i'm interested in doing some research even before joining the university so i choose bachelor's and masters to uh, join dual degree course and yeah at that time i am uh, i took some independent study courses with bipin indra yes, sir and he he was teaching cognitive sciences courses and that's when i got quite interested in understanding human visual system like how interesting to how it works and how fascinating it is and so at that time my so i thought it would be nice i got quite interested in the understanding human visual system and then i started doing some perceptual studies that's where i did my masters on like doing perceptual studies on radiologist and uh, to see how they read chest x rays kind of things to see what insights we can get so that's that's how i start i got more interest in doing research on uh, mainly the to understand human visual system right but you were quite interested in research from the beginning so that was not a choice you made later but it was something that you started with right Yeah, yeah. I was quite interested in doing research in the beginning, but I was not sure what to do research on because research could be anything. And right. So because of this independent study with Bipin Indrakya sir and also the cognitive sciences courses, and uh, I got interested in the, this visual system and what are the what are the principles behind this human visual system. Okay. And when did machine learning or deep learning start coming into the picture? Like, was it during your B Tech or during your M Tech? yeah there are actually different ways of studying visual system one is like anatomical way like one can actually dissect the visual system and put electrodes in the brain and see what is going on and second one is like probably uh, perceptual studies like uh, uh 
to see how the visual system responds when you are showing showing different stimuli to the person and the third way is probably more computational like uh, like using machine learning and using computer vision techniques to mimic what visual system could do what could be the good principles behind such visual system to see if this computer vision system gets successful probably this is probably close to what visual system is doing uh, something like that and the fourth one is probably the evolutionary studies how the how the how the visual system evolved from the let's say from before primates or from uh, from very uh, early evolutionary species, species to ours and see how the visual system evolved uh, so initially i thought doing this perceptual studies will be the probably the most uh, direct way of knowing about human vision kind of thing because i can i could not do anatomical studies because i didn't have background in that so i thought mm-hmm. perceptual studies is probably the way i could go i could use both uh, directly study humans and see how their perceptual system works but after doing research on it for a one for more than a year or or a couple of years i feel the field is going too slow i mean the amount of uh, the findings we can get from such perceptual studies is super noisy and we can we could not get uh, many participants mm-hmm. and it's not it's very difficult to find your insights in this so that's when i thought probably i could make more progress by switching to computer vision like more machine learning based computer vision systems and probably there i could learn more about the fundamentals behind the computer vision systems or machine learning systems okay. that's how i got started in this uh, right, computer right. vision and machine learning things and that's when i started uh, looking for phd positions or intensive positions uh, yeah. right so before before we talk about your phd uh, one last thing about triple it so you told me that triple it is probably one of the most favorite places of yours um so what is one thing that you miss about the college the most or one most favorite thing about the college there are there are a few things i miss the uh, miss there one is friends uh, i think at triple it i made one of the great lifelong friends probably because of the hostel environment you stay there all the time and then like uh also probably because uh plus one and rest are so hectic it was like like in jail and <laughs> the plate is becomes it's, it's, it's like complete freedom after that and it's probably also because of that you make very good friends and lifelong friends there right it's probably one thing i miss the most and also it is quite convenient at the plate like it's it's difficult to get food whenever you're hungry or And it's hmm. also you don't have to <laughs> yourself it's it's right. it's quite i mean people don't realize it they once once you go out to let's say abroad you have to do a lot lot of things by yourself <laughs> and there's always someone to who can clean your room and it's it's right, it's right. quite convenient <laughs> so also in terms of convenience it's quite good there yeah right right which hostel were you living in was it the uh, old boys hostel i was initially i was living for the past past two three years we were li- living in new boys hostel oh uh i don't know if it is still organized like yeah, so a, there is new boys hostel uh, and old boys hostel yeah yeah and and the last year we moved to old boys hostel the last new was right yeah I, at that time those names were not there actually oh yeah. okay I kept this right. names probably right before i was moving up mm-hmm. so i don't remember those names clearly which <laughs> which, right. which new was is which was to wait wait so let's come back to your uh, academic uh, career and so like uh, you were talking about your phd and so um what was the motivation behind the phd what work did you want to sort of pursue in a phd and why did you go to max lang institute and like how did that happen uh yeah as i said before i was i was looking for positions uh, for that are related to computer vision and machine learning things and uh, so i went to do an internship at max planck institute and my advisor was peter geller and he gave me a nice internship opportunity to see if i will be interested in phd or if it is a mutually interesting place for both him and me 
to do PhD there. And we had a quite good internship experience for three months. And then he offered me PhD position there and I immediately accepted. And uh, he's a very machine learning person. He came from a machine learning background, but he works with computer vision problems. So I thought it would be a very good setting for me to learn about machine learning and also apply to computer vision problems. Things. Right. So which specific problem like what was your focus on like during your PhD? Which part of computer vision yeah, were you focused the, on? So at that time, I was mostly focusing on learning aspect, learning techniques, uh, things. So at that time, it was kind of like deep learning was only getting into the field, uh, in the field in the sense that it was getting popular. It was already there, deep learning was there for the past 20, 30 years, but it right. was getting popular. It's around 2013. Uh, deep learning was still not so popular. And uh, at that time, the more popular paradigm for computer vision systems is probabilistic graphical models. So, so I was mostly interested in learning about probabilistic graphical models and what we can research on probabilistic graphical models. At that time, one of the popular inference techniques is that like these uh, sampling techniques, Markovich and Monte Carlo techniques, or uh, message passing techniques. So my my research uh, was mostly on how can we improve inference on probabilistic graphical models, not specific computer vision problem, on general probabilistic graphical models how can we make the inference faster? So that was one of the main problems is that like the inference in these systems is quite slow. So because it involves some optimization during inference time. So how can we make it faster by using some learning techniques like random forests or deep networks? That was nice. right, so it was about optimizing the machine learning aspects and less on the vision part. Yeah, it is. It is. It is more. It is. It was less on the vision part. It is more on the learning side. And but but I'm still working with vision applications. That I'm still interested in vision applications. So the the motivation comes from vision applications, but the research is mostly on learning part. Right. Right. So yeah. uh, after your PhD, uh, you moved to Nvidia, and then now you're at Google Research. So how has your research and out like from from your PhD to now like how has how has it shaped how have your fields of interest changed over time? Or uh, yeah, over so time? so one thing that changed is that like during the during the first years of my PhD, as I said, I was mostly concentrating on probabilistic graphical models, and after that, the deep learnings were getting quite popular in around 2014, 2015. Deep learnings were getting quite popular at that point everywhere. So that's when I switched also my research topic to towards deep learning and I was trying to see how can we introduce better structured filters into deep networks like instead of using standard convolution networks can we use more structured prediction kind of filters into deep networks uh, so that's when that's that's one thing that changed during these things I, I'm still working with the deep networks mostly uh, so that that is one thing changed in terms of topic because the field also changed quite a bit from 2013 to now. Now most of the pep, most of the research is going on with the deep networks and computer vision. And, and there are few things personally that changed. I think probably for everyone is as you as you stay longer in the research, as as you get more experience. So one thing that uh, I think everyone learns that I also got better at is. Uh, how can we ask better questions? How can we ask better research questions? So during the initial days of my PhD, I was mostly relying on my advisor like, because he asked the most interesting questions and I and I and I have a discussion with him to actually refine those questions or change those questions into something more that I like. But now I can come up with more questions by myself. So that's that's what anyone could learn. That that's probably I feel is the most in, in, important things for any, to do any research to have our own research agenda or something we have to ask for questions by ourselves some good interesting questions that's one thing that changed and, and another thing that i learned that i got better is in paper writing like uh, because it's also very important to express your ideas express your findings in research it is not just doing research and during my phd i was also again relying a lot on my advisor to help me writing because I read something he changes a lot and that's how I learned like how he changed from my writing right. things. And now I get more better and 
now I am helping students, some of the students, they write something and I change and they also learn from me. That's, that's also, I'm, I'm still not, I cannot say I'm still very good at it, but uh, uh, I got definitely better from few years ago. Right, right. So what is your research focused on? Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> Uh, yeah. I'm so just saying what, that, like, yeah, yeah, these are the few things that changed over these years. I mean, there are several other things, but these are probably the most important things. Right. So what is your research focused on now? Like, in the coming few months, what topics would you be working on? Like, now that CVPR is over and the new RIFT deadline is also gone. So could you talk about some of the recent projects that you're working on? Uh, I cannot give very minor details because I'm working in Google, so I cannot disclose all the things but in general the main topics will be still on like self-supervised learning and hmm. uh like yeah so those are the that is the main thing and also trying to improve neural networks itself like how can we make neural network architectures or neural network filters uh, better for some reason tasks where the data is less or for example for sparse data for, for high dimensional data how can we make neural networks better there is more technical aspect from the computer vision aspects, also from the learning aspects is how can we make systems more self-supervised or more unsupervised? Yeah, those are the right. main things. Yes. Right, right. So I've noticed that in the computer vision space, you have covered a lot of ground. Uh, you have worked on semantic segmentation, flow computation, activity recognition. And so um, I'm curious about like if you have any preference for any one field in terms of the societal impact that these fields have? Like, is there one that stands out for you? Uh, yeah, so as I said before, my, my main interest is into tackle computer vision as a whole. Like I, I see a lot of these problems are kind of interrelated kind of thing. So yeah, yeah, a lot of these problems are interrelated. So I feel that I've, uh, so my main interest is to see computer vision as a whole, to see what are the fundamental principles behind these computer vision systems. And so that's why I usually try to find the, what are the fundamental learning principles behind this. So I try to cover as much ground as possible in different computer vision areas, like dealing with images, videos, or 3D point clouds. Those are kind of like input modalities. I feel those are the fundamental input modalities. And also in terms of techniques, I worked on like fully, fully supervised, self-supervised, and weekly supervised techniques. So also I would like to see what are the uh, principles behind each of these different supervision regimes. And yeah, so I am not particularly interested in specific problems, so specific applications. So I am still mostly interested in like. In each of these applications, what is the principles behind learning systems? And at some point, I would like to I would like to connect the dots to see. So we find some interesting principles here, so we can apply, which could be applied to some other domain as well. And that's yeah, that's how I see my research as. Does, right. it, does it answer your question? I don't know. Yeah, it does. It does definitely does. All right. Uh, so one of your most popular papers, popular like. Uh, because of how, because of its applications is super slow-mo and uh, it came out in 2018, if I'm right. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, right, right. So I wanted to ask you a few questions about the project, how it started, about the challenges that you faced along the way, about what sort of were the key design decisions that helped you, things that probably can't be covered in a paper. So uh, like, like we can start by talking about how the project started and what was the main inspiration initially? Yeah, so it was an internship project at NVIDIA in 2017 summer and the intern was Waiju, so Waiju was young and, and, the, and the other mentor for the project was De Ching San. And so, so we were three, we, we three were brainstorming about the project directions and things that we could do. And like, uh, so the Ching San is an expert on motion understanding, like optical flow. And uh, and I had I had more experience on kind of like learning things and more more like self-supervised things. And 
so why so so we were trying to find some project that is also kind of helps uh, beneficial to nvidia so a bit application oriented so we thought this would be a nice project with to do this video interpolation thing and without uh, so the so so nice thing about this project is that like the more from a, from a more technical point of view is that like we do this video interpolation via explicit optical flow estimation thing but but without optical flow as supervision so we don't have ground truth optical flow to train these systems so we we first print an off for a for a given two frames we first print an optical flow between those two frames and do video interpolations completely based on this optical flow so there are a few nice findings is that like one nice finding is that like just from optical flow we found that we can get good video interpolation purely relying on optical flow yeah. and we also found out that we can actually learn a good optical flow just based on video interpolation supervision without any supervising signal right with yeah without any supervising signal on the optical flow just from the video interpolation but intermediate frame supervision we can get good optical flow we can by training it into in an end to end fashion i believe end to end fashion kind of thing like so it got yeah that probably became quite catchy because it has nice applications of this like uh, slow motion the slow motion of existing videos and yeah it is a it is a nice project and we learned a lot from it especially on motion understanding and how it is related to video interpolation right so do you remember any of the challenges that you faced uh, in the beginning that probably yeah any challenges that made it difficult to sort of get better results uh i think the main challenges is to find good slow motion videos for training and also we tried different architectures to actually how can we from uh, interpolation so how can we uh, deal with occlusions between frame 1 and frame 2 so there will be some occlusions there will be some missing regions uh, so this frame 1 and frame 2 because of the objects are moving so some some pixels get occluded and some pixels get disoccluded so how can we explicitly deal with occlusions and disocclusions that is a most that is a main challenge for this project and we had some uh, techniques to deal with that definitely it's either has this method been applied in any of the nvidia products or like is it just for uh, research purposes i think uh, by the time i left nvidia they still haven't applied but they patented this so they they are definitely interested in using this in some of their uh applications i guess yeah right all right so um i wanted to know like uh, what do you find most fascinating or more satisfying about your research i mean do you think about it in this way or like about the pleasures of working in research or like of the research you do like does it fascinate you yeah so the most thing that fascinates me is to like trying to answer some of the fundamental questions in let's say in computer vision or machine learning so that that's what's most interest me so i'm not that much application person but i mean i actually get excited when i when the techniques that i develop can could be used in nice applications nice but i'm actually more excited about like whether i am i am able to answer some interesting questions that could benefit different application that could benefit the field that's what most excites me the most yeah in right. general the process of doing research is i like it like it's so you do something so you try you find some interesting insights and try you refine the approach and again you do things i mean the research is quite hard like in the sense it's it, 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 take, it takes a lot of iterations and it takes a lot of effort and it's you fail 90% of time and you succeed 10% of time and there's both of ups and downs and but it is rewarding even if you fail 90% of time you you will find good insights and then you can uh find some insights and then you can in, improve the approach the process is quite interesting for me right so uh you know how uh how overwhelming the number of the amount of research in deep learning has become there are hundreds of papers being published every day and it's quite difficult to keep track of all of this research and even if you are working on one specific field inside computer vision 
then also there are a lot of papers that you need to read every day if you want to be updated about every single thing but since that is not possible for most people so um what how do you uh, try to be updated with the research and you know be updated about what's going on in the field right now except for probably seeing what papers are published in the top 3 4 conferences like yeah so what works for you that way uh i don't know if it completely works but i i usually follow archive every day like archive feed like i i subscribe to archive and for machine learning and computer vision things and yeah it takes probably 15 20 minutes to just scroll through the archive feed and see some interesting papers but i still some days i miss but most of the days i try to catch up with archive things that at least helps me in keeping track of newer research what is going on and but i have to admit that i have to uh my focus has been narrowing down on few topics than before for example few years before i used to check also papers from more machine learning things but which are not related to my current research but now it's getting more and more difficult to keep track of like more broader area that what is happening in let's say svm research or what is happening in like let's say marco chen monte carlo sampling or like what are the latest advances but uh, yeah somehow that i feel i, I feel that I, i wish i have more time to catch up with what is going on in the overall area but uh, unfortunately i had to narrow down my focus on like few topics that i am currently interested in and then uh, try to make a reading list out of those topics and then read those papers later on it's yeah in general i find it interesting because during my bachelor's i used to read i had a very general focus on science in the sense that like i used to read check science daily uh, there is a website called sciencedaily.com which which actually reports some interesting news science news from different areas like biology physics and what what are the recent breakthroughs or recent interesting things happening there so i used to check general science as a whole what is happening in the field as a whole but during my phd i had to narrow my focus to machine learning and what is happening in entire machine learning and computer vision and now i had to narrow my focus even more on to like uh my few areas of research like self supervised learning deep learning and uh computer vision things and so they are both good and bad since i'm narrowing focus i can get more time to focus on these things the bad thing is a problem i'm losing some bigger picture on a whole like what is happening in biology what is happening in uh, i know yeah i still try to catch up on those from time to time but it's it is getting difficult as the computer vision field is growing quite a lot there are so much new works and interesting works coming in even in such narrow area that is difficult to catch up right but this is where like conferences can help where you can get a big a big picture view of like what things are like what things are like getting more important these days and what are the recent works in different fields and you can get all of that in one place in one conference so that is where probably yeah. people can get the gist of the field yeah exactly so 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 conference i still feel are quite interesting even though now we can see everything in online and archive before the conference is one place especially for physical conferences when you go there so you have 3 4 days to spend there 3 to 5 days to spend there and you actually physically are there and mentally prepared to consume all the what is going on in the field like so that's also one good thing in having physical conference because you are out of work for this bit of out of your standard work but this is out of your city time. also so in a, in a new city different city beautiful place and all of that probably yeah. adds up and makes it a really yeah. good learning experience i think experience yeah but with the virtual conference it gets difficult because you are still doing your own work and not completely focusing on the conference because you still have your own meetings and like uh stuff and yeah I, yeah as yeah as i said it is, it is it is right the conference has still a very good way to know what is going on in the field right but even though uh, even though it it's a little difficult to do all of that on your laptop sitting at home but it is like you mentioned it is better for people like us who uh 
like otherwise also couldn't attend these conferences either because we didn't have work in those conferences or we couldn't afford to attend the conference but but like now we can just sit here and we can get insights from conversations like uh, like the panel that you organized like panels like those and sort of get a summary of the whole field so like your novel view synthesis uh, tutorial was about less than 6 hours long 4 or 5 hours long i think excluding yeah, the breaks so like hours, yeah. if anyone spends that much time on one in one sitting like they can get a big picture view of of what of whatever is happening in novel view synthesis and that way i think it can help beginners like us a lot yeah yeah definitely yeah yeah there are these positive sides of this having this virtual conference because now everything is online i mean people put extra effort in putting everything online because they have to do it like because we have to record in youtube or live stream because it is virtual mm-hmm. so now yeah now much more people can benefit afterwards as well like it's people can watch it's good. yeah i think i think probably we should have try to try to do both both physical and virtual together try to bring the try to bring the best of both worlds right so it can be a physical conference as well as being streamed on yeah the being streamed internet yeah that would be nice actually right 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 uh, okay so we talked about uh, your process of reading papers about about yeah about trying to see whatever is happening but the next step of trying to know about whatever is happening is to sort of organize that knowledge or conceptualize it or you know make notes or take insights from whatever you're reading so uh, is there any specific tool that works for you to sort of amalgamate all of the knowledge that you get from from the meetings that you have with with your teammates or the papers that you read or your experiments so yeah like you said you're working on multiple projects at one time and trying to see how different insights relate to each other how different how something that works in one field how it could benefit the other application so uh how do you see the importance of you know having a system wherein you can sort of merge all of that knowledge into something that is you know that can guide your future research as well as make better sense of uh whatever you are coming across so is there something that works for you and uh how do you see how do you see this process of you know uh encoding different fields of knowledge yeah, yeah uh I don't, I don't have a very clear answer to that because I'm also not very good at organizing all the things. Uh, one thing that I try to do is that at least try to do is that like, whenever I see some interesting paper, I add it to my reading list, like in, like in a Google Drive somewhere, and uh, and try to go through that reading list as soon as I can and try to find what are the insights in those works. And yeah. in general it, i like to keep track of like what are the fundamental things happening in each of these what is the fundamental processing techniques for point clouds and what are the fundamental let's say what are the fundamental processing techniques for video processing and let's say for motion understanding and so i don't have any other specific tools that i use i usually yeah just keep track of the papers and try to read them which i have to confess that it's very getting more and more difficult to find time to read more papers and yeah i also have to be better at that and yeah in general other than that i don't think i have any other clear tools that i use i'm just trying to think right so sub- subscribing to the archive newsletter adding your favorite papers to a reading list and then sort of yeah. reading them later as long as the reading list is being emptied out slowly and slowly it's a good thing i think yeah but it but it's very difficult to empty it out like <laughs> first right. first i had more papers and then i will see okay now i don't have my, enough time to read this problem right. read this later on so short listing it so, again and then picking yeah, out so picking out what are the more more important things to read now for the current projects and, yeah In, in general i feel it is very good it is important to have an overview of the field to to be able to come up with new interesting questions and in the 
in research and as i said it's it's it is getting more and more difficult to keep track of the entire field but i hope uh, i hope i could get better right so uh, like before we close like could you share any advice for people who are starting out with machine learning deep learning or computer vision in general um uh, something that worked for you when you started for example you said that you used to read the science daily every day and try to have a sense of the most important things in all of the, all of the different fields uh so like any other things like that which you feel were important in you reaching where you are now and yeah anything that would help someone starting out anything that probably you would have suggested yourself 10 years back like knowing mm-hmm. how it would turn out in the end uh i don't know if i have any clear suggestions i mean i don't see myself as a uh great researcher i'm still trying to become better researcher in this so yeah i think i think one thing that anyone will face is that like there will be a lot of setbacks in research like it's research is a hard hard process and so we need to be persistent with that and that's where so i don't know for me i try to focus more on learning what i learn because it is very helpful in formulating interesting problems for future research that's very important for future research so uh, i feel that many people don't value the that learning as much as getting paper at that at that point so getting papers is important and getting publications is important to do let's say phd but also these setbacks are also very important like if you are not taking difficult problems you cannot get these setbacks and you cannot get such learning experiences mm-hmm. so so the harder problems you choose the more fundamental problems you choose the more difficult it, it gets to it is becomes to publish but that learning experience is very valuable that actually even though probably you may publish slower initially but you can do much better research that one can do much better research by focusing on fundamental problems instead of instead of just focusing on low hanging fruits and then just trying to publish as soon as possible so i still feel it's important like it's uh, because at the end of the day is such fundamental techniques that's what the matters especially now there are so many papers coming out now and actually during my phd it was much more difficult to publish a paper because it, even setting up a baseline takes a lot of time because there was no standardized system like like now because of the deep learning everything gets standardized and libraries get standardized at the time each one used a different learning technique and optimization techniques and even getting up the state of the art it's very difficult and but now it's the things change a lot now things get more easier to publish now things gets more engineering oriented but i feel that more fundamental research oriented uh, if you try to answer fundamental questions it may get difficult in research but it will help people in long run right uh, you talked about the difficulty of performing experiments back then about the lack of standardization that's there now so what was mm, like it is getting easier now so you read a paper they it's quite likely that they would have open sourced the code but previously mm-hmm. probably it was not that prevalent back then you had to implement their method to show to compare with your result so like what i mean how did that work before like did did people just use the results that were published in the previous paper or did or did they have to implement those experiments from scratch and then like spend extra time on doing that yeah so previously what what used to be the case is that like you need you spend first one two years of the phd just getting up to state of the art to, on some problem or actually continue the previous phd students work because there is already in that lab mm-hmm. because there is already state of the art system there and so once you get the state of the art system you can continue working on that because it gets easier to make iterations on that I think that seems to be the case. That's so people usually stick to their own field during the course of their PhD or during the course of their research because it's very difficult to switch to completely different research because it's difficult to get startup time is more. 
but now people can switch easily switch to different areas of research which is quite nice nothing so it also comes with some drawbacks i mean having this open source is quite nice i uh, I, I i quite like it you can already work with existing codes and you can already start experimenting with new things without spending too much time but on the other hand i feel that like those who are starting out new these days once yeah since the codes are easily available they can directly run these codes i feel that many of the students are also getting false sense that they completely understood what is going on there just because they got the output from an existing code existing code they get the false sense that they already so they think that's that's that is good enough for research but that is not actually they need to understand what is happening okay. in the paper and what is happening in the code like it's not it is definitely not enough just to run the code and get the result out of it right? probably so, it is better to it is more important to understand the design decisions behind the code behind yeah, why so let's I mean, say a relu activation was used why five layers were used why an attention module was added or things like that instead of just yeah. running the code because i mean like you just have to figure out where like which classes are being used and how you can put things together and just get things to work like yeah, yeah you should focus more on the fundamental uh, yeah, design fundamental decisions principles that have... behind it yeah. principles so 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 before as i said before since there was no standardized techniques people were forced to do that because they had to implement the things while implementing right. you actually learn a lot right right so okay we need, we need to make this design choice we need to make, use this principle here hmm. but now yeah probably one advice to the people who are starting out now is that focus more on principles as well not just running the code and some trying or it is not just engineering problem we need to see that as a more scientific problem right all right thank you varun thank you so much for talking to me and for sharing your journey your insights your experiences um thank you for doing this interview yeah thanks yeah thanks for inviting me to your podcast and thanks for the interesting questions mm-hmm.